Mass events are held in Israel. The multi-thousand event will begin on Sunday, March 31st. This was reported by the Times of Israel. The participants of the action demand the resignation of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and the holding of early elections. One of the main demands of the protesters is to reach an agreement on the release of 130 hostages held in the Gaza Strip. They accused the government of blocking negotiations on the release of the hostages. It is reported that the actions will last for four days according to the Israeli press, this protest is the largest since the attack of Hamas on Israel on October 7, 2023. According to preliminary information, more than 100,000 people are participating in the action. Demonstrators on Sunday evening blocked a main city highway after earlier rallying in front of the Israeli parliament, lighting fires and waving the national flag. Police used water cannon against the crowd and jostled and pushed protesters back as they shouted that Netanyahu must go. Pressure has been growing on the prime minister as opponents of his right-wing government have found common cause with the families of the hundred or more captives still held by the Palestinian group Hamas in Gaza. The families have pledged to take to the streets every night this week as they call for the government to bring them home, many protesters carry placards of. Netanyahu's face covered in blood, accusing him of failing to protect the country from Hamas. Even before Israel's war on Gaza, Netanyahu had faced months of street protests over controversial judicial reforms. Are we spending our money to go for them? Yeah, um, it's Joe Biden's reason. We need to get humanitarian aid into Gaza. I don't think we should. I, I don't think any of our aid that goes to Israel support our greatest ally, arguably in the world, to defeat Hamas, and Iran, and Russia, and probably North Korea is in there in China too, with them and helping, helping uh, <coughs> Hamas. We shouldn't be spending a dime on humanitarian aid. It, it, it should be like Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Russia started production of the KH-101 with two warheads, making the missile twice as dangerous. Ukrainian air defense shot down a modified Russian KH-101 cruise missile, which had a tandem warhead. The modified version received an additional warhead, doubling its total equivalent from 450 kilograms to about 800 kilograms. The second warhead includes cubic-shaped steel fragments to increase combat efficiency. It is likely that the additional space for the extra warhead was created by reducing the volume of the fuel tank. This is likely to affect the range of the cruise missile, but given the territory of Ukraine, the decrease in range is not critical. According to Defense Express, the installation of an additional warhead, in addition to the usual fragmentation high explosive one, occurred due to the reduction in the size of the fuel tank. What this means is a reduction in the flight range of the KH-101 from 5,500 km to a hypothetical 2,250 km, which doesn't have much significance. In case of launching such missiles from the Saratov region, even targeting objects in the Lviv region, the KH-101 will still have 500 to 700 km remaining for additional maneuvers. As for the mechanism of releasing the warhead of the missile, which is used in the new version of the KH-101, it is currently unknown. KH-101 is a strategic cruise missile developed with radar cross-section reduction technology. A missile with a special nuclear warhead has a KH-102 index. It has been developed since 1995 and was adopted in 2013. The carrier of the missile is a TU-95MSM turboprop strategic bomber and TU-160. The missile uses a combined inertial guidance system with optical electronic adjustment, with the homing head activated at the final stages of flight. In the transport position, the engine is a turbojet dual circuit. The R95TM 300 models are located inside, the wings are folded under the missile and the tail is also folded. After starting, the engine extends out of the body and the tail decomposes. Europe in pre-war era due to Russia's threat, Poland's Prime Minister warns. Polish Prime Minister Donald Tusk has warned that Europe is in a pre-war era but still has a long way to go before it's ready to confront the threat posed by Russia. 
War is no longer a concept from the past. It is real, and it started over two years ago. The most worrying thing at the moment is that literally any scenario is possible. We haven't seen a situation like this since 1945, Tusk said in an interview with German newspaper Die Welt published on Friday. I know it sounds devastating, especially for the younger generation, but we have to get used to the fact that a new era has begun, the pre-war era. I'm not exaggerating. It's becoming clearer every day. Last weekend, Poland said a Russian cruise missile aimed at Ukraine had entered its airspace, a repeat occurrence during more than two years of war, and demanded an explanation from Moscow. Despite Europe's efforts to bolster its defense, Tusk said the continent still has a long way to go. He said it must be independent and self-sufficient in defense while maintaining a strong alliance in the US. Polish President Andrzej Duda also stated that Russia could soon restore its military potential and attack NATO countries as early as 2026. Federal Minister for Foreign Affairs Annalena Baerbock also says that Vladimir Putin is trying to drag NATO into a war, but Germany will not allow him. Putin's goal was and is to destroy the existence of Ukraine as an independent, free country and drag NATO into a war, Baerbock said, noting that the German government will not allow this to happen. The German foreign minister adds that the Kremlin leader is not open to arguments, calls for humanity and does not want to engage in negotiations.